I'm Dr. Fred B. Sieber, Professor of Physics and Photonics at Camden County College. Laser safety is based primarily on the eye. The eye is very sensitive to laser light, and uh, the second concern is the skin. And why is the eye a major concern? Because the eye has a lens that is extremely converging and will focus the light on the fovea of the eye, which is at the retina. So, for example, when you have a one milliwatt per square centimeter beam coming in, which is considered to be a very low powered laser beam and irradiance, the eye will increase that by 100,000 times to 100 watts per square centimeter. This is a concern that we have in laser safety to make sure that when we have considerable laser power, that we have the proper eye protection. As of 2008, ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, adopted a new standard for laser classifications. So let's talk about the old ones first. And why are we going to do that? Because you're going to find out that when you get into industry and you uh, still purchase lasers, they have not caught up with the new standard. And uh, we have to recognize the old standards. What is a class one laser? Class 1 laser is a very, very safe laser that will not cause any eye problems, skin problems, or any problems at all. You don't need any protection, eye protection. You can stand right next to it. So a Class 1 laser is one that emits hardly any radiation. Uh, in fact, less than 400 microwatts. But the, you also have to realize that most Class 1 lasers are embedded into cabinetry that you don't want to open without the consulting of a laser safety officer or an LSO. Class II lasers are visible lasers of one milliwatt. Here I want to show you a Class II laser. You'll notice the beam against this white piece of paper, and uh, you can see, get an idea of some of the intensity. This is a helium neon laser, so the beam is red. Class II lasers do, do not need any protection. All they need is the natural aversion response, which means that if this beam was to flash in your eye, you would normally just pull your eye away because the brightness would be an alert to the retina that something's come into your eye that's not comfortable. We want to talk about a Class III laser. Class III laser is uh, classified into Class 3A and Class 3B. Class 3A laser is 1 to 5 milliwatts, and most laser pointers are Class 3A lasers. Now, you saw a Class 2 laser before and its intensity. I want to show you a Class 3A laser, and this way you can tell the difference. There, there is quite a difference in intensity. This is a green beam versus a red beam. This beam you're looking at is five times more intense 5 milliwatts from the first beam, which was 1 milliwatt. A Class 3A laser, again, uh, depends on the natural aversion response, which is a quarter of a second for eye protection. You don't need any type of eye protection with this laser. Class 3B laser, we start to get into the dangerous uh, classifications of lasers. With Class 3B and Class 4 lasers, you do have to consult the laser safety officer. And a Class 3B laser is from 5 milliwatts to a half a watt or 500 milliwatts. A Class 3B laser does not depend on the natural response of a quarter of a second of the eye or the blinking of the eye, meaning that it's not going to protect you because the power of that laser is more intense. All laser beams should never be looked into, which is called interbeam viewing. All lasers that are shown on what we call specular reflectors, which is mirror-like surfaces, should not be looked at as well. However, for a class 2 and a class 3A, a diffuse reflection is safe, meaning, for instance, against the cinder block where the beam's going to scatter. But once you get to a class 3B, uh, most diffuse reflections are also safe until you get up to well, about 500 milliwatts. Class 3B lasers are not fire hazards. They're not intense enough usually to start a fire. Now when we talk about a Class 4 laser, these are dangerous lasers. 
This is anything over a half a watt of power, which is 500 milliwatts. Diffuse reflections are dangerous. Specular reflections are dangerous. They become a fire hazard. You certainly need personal eye protection for these lasers. In fact, a class four laser, the powers are tremendous where megawatts powers are, are very common out in industry now. Universities and educational institutions need to sometimes modify their lasers to deal with their experiments. So they take the cabinetry off and they are open beam. As you'll see this young lady working with a class four laser in an educational institution, you can see the beam, you notice that she has eye protection. Before she turned on that laser, she had to know exactly where that beam was going because you can see there are specular reflectors as well. ANSI has developed a new standard for classifications, laser classifications. And what was called class one has now been kind of subdivided into class one and class one M. They're basically the same laser powers. The only difference is, is that if you take what comes out of a class one laser and put it into a, a converging lens or any type of optics that's going to converge that beam, it now becomes somewhat dangerous, somewhat dangerous. There is a converging optic that's going to concentrate that beam down. Then you do have to take some proportions but still basically very safe lasers. So we went from a class one from the old system to a class one and a class one M. A class two in the new version is exactly the class two in the old version. Nothing changes, but the two M now is just like with the one M. So if it's rated as a class two M laser, you know somebody has taken that class two laser and put optics attached to it which now converges that beam, increases the irradiance, and makes it more dangerous. A class 3A laser now becomes a class 3R laser. A class 3R laser can be visible or non-visible. When it's visible, you depend on the natural inversion response of a quarter of a second. If it's not visible, the retina of that eye cannot perceive that light coming in so what happens there is that you still don't need any special eye protection because you cannot fixate on that beam long enough, even though it's not visible, to do much damage. So you still don't need any special eye protection for a class 3R laser. Class 3B stays the same as it was before. It, from 5 milliwatts to 500 milliwatts, specular reflections are dangerous. Diffuse reflections generally are not dangerous eye protection is needed. Class 4 lasers don't change at all. In the new version of ANSI, it's still a class 4 laser, which means specular reflections are dangerous. Diffuse reflections are dangerous. And let me make sure you understand the difference. A specular reflection is off a shiny mirror-like surface. A diffuse reflection is off something that is rough, again, like it could be cinder block I always use as an example, or brick, but something that is irregular. Fire hazards are possible with a class 4 laser, meaning if you shine a class 4 laser on, let's say, a drape, it will go on fire. Skin protection is necessary for class 4 lasers. It will burn your hand, It'll, so all these are precautions that are necessary. Okay, I'd like to just show you a summary uh, table on laser classes. Class 1 is now class 1 and class 1 M. Let me explain why. Class 2 is now class 2 and class 2 M. Class 3 small a is now class 3 capital R. Class 3 B doesn't change except now it's a capital B. Class 4 is still class 4. A very important uh, concept is what we call maximum permissible exposure, or MPE. This is the maximum permissible exposure that the eye can take without having any protection like goggles. What determines this is the power of the laser, the wavelength of the laser, and the exposure time. 
Wavelength of the laser is very important because lasers range from ultraviolet, like an extra laser, to visible lasers, like the helium neon laser, to the near infrared laser, which is commonly referred to as the neodymium YAG laser, to far infrared and middle infrared lasers, which are CO2 lasers. Anything in the ocular focus, which is from 400 nanometers to 1400 nanometers, that is visible in near infrared, will be focused on the retina. Anything outside of the ocular focus focuses on the lens and the cornea of the eye. So wavelengths is important to understand how much exposure the cornea can take, how much exposure the retina can take. So wavelengths is important. But also duration, how much time. Your table in your book shows uh, three different time periods. It shows uh, the natural reflex response of a quarter second. It also shows 10 seconds, which is uh, a reasonable time period that most people who might be exposed uh, to laser light. But it also shows that many technicians are working with lasers for an eight-hour day. These numbers, again, are going to be in milliwatts per uh, square centimeter or watts per square centimeter. It, it's a measure of intensity on the cornea of the eye or the retina of the eye. MPE determines what we call nominal hazard zone. And that is the space within that you need protection. If you're going to have to need eye protection, sometimes skin protection. A nominal hazard zone would be if you were in the path of a beam, if you're interbeam viewing. But nominal hazard zones are also created by reflection. If you are in the path of a specular reflection of a beam, whether it be a, a flat reflector, whether it be a converging reflector, or a diverging reflector, you can very well be in a nominal hazard zone. The LSO is a very important person. That's the laser safety officer. He will mathematically, by equation, determine whether you need eye protection or skin protection if you're within that zone. We're looking at a table here that's going to have laser types, exposure time, and ranges in meters for diffuse reflections, lens on the laser, and direct. These are all class four lasers. The neodymium YAG laser is going to be in the near infrared, but it will be focused on the retina of the eye. But let's assume you're working with a neodymium laser that is trimming all day long for eight hours. That means that if you are going to be within 1.4 meters of a diffuse reflector, then you need eye protection. Now, you're going to take that beam and you're going to focus it uh, by using some converging optic of some sort. Then you need to be 11.3 meters away from that beam, the length of a good size room. That means if you're working within that 11.3 meters, you need eye protection. Direct means now you are interbeam viewing. You're looking into that laser beam 1,410 meters. That means you're at the other end of a long building. That's for eight hours. For 10 seconds, you'll notice because the duration time has considerably been reduced, so will be some of the ranges. 0.8 meters for diffuse, 6.3 lens on the laser, direct is 792. Now let's look at a CO2 laser. CO2 laser is in the far infrared, 10.6 microns. No longer in the ocular focus, this beam is going to be concentrated on the cornea of the eye and the lens of the eye. You notice the numbers are the same because of the fact that it's on the cornea of the eye, meaning the damage is going to be done uh, if you're inside that nominal hazard zone. And time factor really doesn't make any difference. 0.4 meters uh, for diffuse, 5.3 meters for lens on the laser, 309 meters for direct. Argon lasers. You might say, wow, okay, you just went from a 500 watt CO2 to a 5 watt argon. Argon light laser in the ocular focus for eight hours. You might be with a, an ophthalmologist. He might be working with that laser all day long. So for diffuse reflector, 
uh, you need to be, if you don't have eye protection now, 12.6 meters away. Well, that's not practical, obviously, if you're, you're an eye surgeon. If you have the lens on that laser, again, because you are changing the irradiance and you are concentrating that beam to a smaller point, you need to be 1.3 kilometers away. That's down the street someplace. Or if it's a direct beam, you need to be 25.2 kilometers away. That's for eight hours. For a quarter of a second, again, we're talking about that natural reflex of the eye. The distances for a diffuse reflector, 0.25 meters. Lens on the laser, 33.3 meters. And for direct, 240 meters. That's for only a quarter of a second. So, reviewing nominal hazard zones, these are the zones where you, the exposure to the eye is above the MPE and you need eye protection. And it depends on the wavelength of that laser, the exposure time of that laser, and the power of that laser. In your situation, where it might be a medical office, it might be a manufacturing uh, floor, it might be a research laboratory, whether that be in a university or in a teaching college. The LSO, the laser safety officer, is the person who's going to determine what that nominal hazard zone is going to be from the parameters that we talked about and from the calculations that you will find in your module 1-3. The ANSI Z136 standard summarizes all of those factors that we talked about today in this tutorial and in your text.